Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Now that we have derived the reactor transfer function, we'll begin describing just how to model a reactor with fuel and moderator feedback. We'll start today by discussing single temperature feedback, which assumes that we only have feedback from moderator effects. The reactivity present in the reactor can be divided into two components. First, the reactivity from external effects, rho x. Rho x could be a control rod insertion, a turbine trip, someone spilling a container of highly enriched uranium-235 solution onto the fuel rods, or any other outside stimulus that acts on the reactor. In contrast to this, the internal reactivity, rho in, includes any internal feedback effects, such as a negative reactivity insertion from a decrease in moderator density, or from Doppler broadening in the fuel as its temperature increases. As before with our other variables, we'll assume that our reactivities are equal to some initial reactivity, rho naught, plus some time-dependent delta rho term. Because reactors are generally assumed to be in a steady state configuration at the start of the transients, these rho naught terms are generally equal to zero. As we discussed initially in chapter 10 of ought, reactor feedback generally depends on the amount of energy released from the fuel, and thus the internal reactivity is equal to the integral of the power released over time weighted by some function h. This expression is actually a convolution of the power and feedback function, and if we take the Laplace transform of a convolution, we see that it equals the Laplace transform of h times the Laplace transform of the delta power term. From here, we can rearrange the terms to show that the transfer function for the internal reactivity feedback with respect to a reactor's power is the Laplace transform of h. Recalling the reactor transfer function, we can replace the delta reactivity term with our expression for the internal and external reactivities, rearrange terms, and then we arrive at this expression for the delta power that occurs in response to some external reactivity effect. In essence, we have proved that our reactor behaves like a simple control system with feedback. Our feedforward element, G of S, is actually the reactor transfer function, and it multiplies some input external reactivity. The resulting delta power signal is then operated on by the feedback function, H of S, to integrate the internal reactivity effects into the overall reactivity. So what is H of S? Well, we can separate H of S into two components, a delta rho with respect to delta T term, and a delta T with respect to delta power term. The derivative of rho with respect to temperature is known as the temperature coefficient of reactivity, alpha. We can have temperature coefficients that are a function of the fuel temperature, the moderator temperature, and really any temperature in the reactor. But all these coefficients are generally represented by the variable alpha. These reactivity coefficients are generally a function of temperature, but for our purposes, we'll assume that these values of alpha are constant over all temperature ranges. Just as I mentioned, internal reactivity effects can arise from any temperature change in the reactor, and we generally divide this feedback into two components. First, feedback from the fuel temperature changes, and second, feedback from the moderator temperature changes. For the time being, we will only consider moderator feedback, but we'll explore fuel feedback effects in the next lecture. When modeling this single temperature moderator feedback, we'll assume several things. The first, as we mentioned before, is that feedback from fuel temperature changes is insignificant. Second, we assume that the fuel temperature changes instantly as the reactor's power changes. This is usually a reasonable assumption, since the heat is generated in the fuel after fission, after all, and also because fuel pins are generally thin to reduce the amount of thermal insulation between the edges of the pin and the center of the pin, which thus lowers the peak center line fuel temperature. Despite the fact that fuel elements tend to be thin, we'll still have to assume that there is some lag time between when heat is generated in the fuel from fission and when it traverses the gap and clad around the fuel to enter the moderator. Lastly, we'll assume that the reactor coolant is the same thing as the reactor's moderator, which is, of course, a valid assumption for light water reactors. However, this assumption breaks down for HTGRs, for CANDUs, or for fast reactors which lack a moderator. Now let's derive the reactor feedback transfer function. The change in a moderator's temperature is proportional to the temperature difference between the fuel and the moderator divided by the sigma fm constant, which is the time constant for the rate of heat transfer between the fuel and the moderator. This temperature change also includes this second term, which describes the lag from flowing or circulating coolant. Heat that is transferred to the moderator must recirculate through the primary coolant system before it re-enters the reactor and has an effect on the entire reactor. 
Thus, there is a lag between when heat enters the moderator and when the entire reactor sees the effect of this heat. Sigma r is the time constant describing a lag from recirculating coolant. Lower values of sigma r mean that the coolant is recirculating more rapidly. And conversely, sigma r approaches infinity for a system with no coolant flow. One of our stated assumptions is that the fuel temperature is proportional to the reactor's power. So we can assume that this delta t fuel term is equal to some constant a prime times delta p. Substituting this into our equations and taking the Laplace transform of both sides allows us to solve for the delta moderator temperature as a function of the delta power, which equals a prime divided by sigma fm times s plus one plus sigma fm divided by sigma r. We can multiply this expression by alpha m, which is the moderator reactivity coefficient, to arrive at this expression for the feedback transfer function, where this constant kt is defined as a prime times alpha m. For non-circulating or stationary coolant, the sigma fm divided by sigma r term reduces to zero, resulting in this expression. Since the moderator reactivity coefficient, alpha m, is typically negative, and we like having positive constants, convention leads us to redefine kt as a prime times the negative of the moderator reactivity coefficient. This has the convenient side effect of transforming our feedback reactor transfer function into a form that has a 1 plus g of s h of s term in its characteristic equation, which very conveniently allows us to analyze our reactor stability using Bode plots. So under what conditions will a reactor with circulating or stationary coolant be stable? Taking the transfer function for a reactor with feedback and substituting in the reactor transfer function, g of s, and the feedback transfer function, h of s, we can simplify our terms to remove all double fractions, and we then arrive at a characteristic equation for our system that's equal to sigma fm times s cubed plus s squared times sigma fm times beta divided by lambda plus r naught, which is here defined to equal one plus sigma fm divided by sigma r, plus s times beta divided by lambda times r naught plus p naught divided by lambda times kt, plus a constant with no powers of s, which is equal to p naught divided by lambda times kt times little lambda. From here, we'll generate a Roth matrix for this characteristic equation to analyze its stability. The left-hand side of this matrix contains the s cubed coefficients, the s squared coefficients, some variable a, which we will examine in a minute, and p naught divided by lambda times kt times little lambda which actually just equals the s to the zeroth power term. Our system will be unstable if any of the constants in this left-hand side are negative. Immediately, we notice that the s to the zeroth power term will become negative if our alpha m coefficient is positive. This means that a positive moderator reactivity coefficient will cause our system to become unstable. This probably isn't very surprising news. One of the key goals when designing a reactor is to ensure that it has a negative moderator reactivity feedback coefficient. But it's useful to have confirmed why this is a design priority using our stability analysis. Lastly, we'll discuss this A term, and we'll see under which conditions it will become negative. A is equal to this combination of the s cubed, s squared, s, and s to the zeroth power coefficients. The s squared term, which equals sigma fm times beta divided by lambda plus r naught, can only be positive. So the only way this expression can become negative is if the numerator is negative. The numerator is equal to this combination of terms, and if we apply an order of magnitude analysis, we see that the numerator roughly equals some 10 to the fourth power term minus a 10 to the first power term. This is good news. This means that a reactor with moderator feedback coefficient will generally be stable as long as the moderator reactivity coefficient is negative. But are there any conditions under which the system can still become unstable? Let's re-examine our numerator term but this time we'll only consider terms that include p naught. As the reactivity's power increases, or as the gain of this system increases, these power terms will dominate the other terms, so it makes sense to reconsider the numerator using only the p naught terms. Doing so gives us a numerator that's equal to kt times p naught divided by lambda times beta divided by lambda plus one plus sigma fm divided by sigma r minus sigma fm times little lambda. So how could this expression become negative? Well, first, it could become negative if beta divided by lambda is small, 
which is something that could occur in a thermal reactor containing plutonium or uranium-233 fuel. PWRs become less stable near the end of their fuel cycles after they've bred in a significant amount of plutonium-239, and this analysis explains why. Next, a reactor could approach instability if sigma-FM is large. In essence, having very slow heat transfer between the fuel and the moderator allows the moderator feedback to become out of phase with the reactor. Next, a reactor could approach instability as sigma-R approaches infinity, which corresponds to having a stationary coolant. Thus, a loss of moderator circulation drives a reactor closer towards instability. Lastly, a reactor could approach instability if little lambda becomes large. Now, because this little lambda is a physical constant describing delayed neutron emission, we can't really change lambda without some sort of physics trickery. This concludes our lecture on reactor stability with single temperature moderator feedback. We have successfully developed an expression that describes feedback effects in reactors, and we have explored under what conditions a reactor with moderator feedback can become unstable. In the next and final lecture of this course, we'll explore reactors' behavior when we have feedback from both the moderator and the fuel.